Officials of the Ministry of Labour, fellow panelists, brothers and sisters. I think I just need to say this one, you know. Hmm. But Reverend Arias and I have had some debate. And I want to focus on those in my uh, brief remark. Yeah. First of all, I want to say that it is not going to be possible for employees to solely determine their days off. Impossible. It happens in no other jurisdiction. What obtains in the United States? The Azonia Board of Education versus Philbox in 1986. Is that if the employer can provide a convincing argument that the request for time off creates what the law calls undue hardship, then it is on legitimate grounds to refuse. There will be no basis upon which an argument can be raised about discrimination on the basis of religion. One, the employer can show clearly and emphatically that to provide for that request would, would lead to undue hardship to the company, then that refusal stands on legitimate and legal grounds. That's the law in the United States. But every other jurisdiction has this. In the determination of time off for any employee, there has to be a balance. Is it going to inconvenience other employees? Is it going to be to the detriment of the business? Those things have to be weighed. So it is not possible for employ that's chaos, for employee to get up and say, I want this day or that day, as the case may be. Because it may very well have an impact upon other, em other employees and other co-workers. And so a balance has to be um, protected. But what is important is that this new policy provides a glorious opportunity for the church. Because previously, the employer under common law could change his hours of work as he sees fit. And you are only left with two days off. Today, or certainly when they pull the law comes into full effect, a negotiation, a discussion has to take place between the employer and the employee. And it may be important to insert, as is, as is the case in Philippines, a clause which says that if, that if there's no agreement, it becomes a grievance subject to arbitration. So that's an opportunity for the Christians, the seventh day, because the other Christians do have that problem, and non-Christians like to say. But the second thing is that they now have three and a half days to worship. Not two anymore. Three and a half days. Because you can complete your 40 hours in three and a half days. So really, this is a, I mean, this is what they should be trumpeting rather than critiquing, because it suits them. But the third point I'd make is simply this: nothing, if there will be no seismic change in employment relationship and work organization when the legislations are amended or repealed. Nothing dramatic. Is going to happen. There are no companies lining up to change them hours at work. Don't expect that. Because all the companies that need think they need to change have already done so. In the sectors and industries that um, Carla 
um, as, as outlined on Raymond. So there is nothing to prevent any company today from looking at their operations, looking at their market, and making a determination as to what is the best production thing for their business. Nothing to stop them. So nothing dramatic is going to happen. Women are working at night. They're not supposed to work on between 10 and 5 in certain sectors. They're working. So, so nothing dramatic is going to happen. The fourth point. In the United States, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is a commission set up to hear grievances, says in this report that less than 3%, less than 3% of the complaints are in the area of religious discrimination. Less than 3%. And in my 20 years of practicing trade union officer, I have come across none. And I've been in charge of companies that are operating on flexi time. I have not come across any situation in which a worker has raised to me that there is a discrimination at, about, against them. Let me correct that. A legitimate complaint. Because there was, in fact, one. And that was because that worker was dishonest. That worker was dishonest. So, companies, for example, like JUTC, cement company and others, have made more than sufficient effort to accommodate what is a right under the law, the right to worship. As it is, a right under the law to join a trade union. None more important than the other. But the employers have discriminated against workers on the basis of their right to join a trade union and have favored them on their right to freedom of worship. That cannot be fair. That's not fair. And so, if we are concerned about the rights of workers, let us not be concerned about the rights of workers to worship. Let us concern about the right of workers to live in a safe environment because Christians live in Riverton. And they must and they they they, they start of right speak to the right of every citizen to live in comfort and in an environment free from interference and degradation. The church must add their voice to that call because there are Christians down there as well. So, all in all, brothers and sisters, there's nothing for the church to worry about. It is not going to affect corporate worship. It is not going to affect what I believe, genuinely believe, is the bottom line. The comfort, the money to the comfort. I genuinely believe that. It's not going to affect that. I genuinely believe that. Right? Please kill me for my sincerity, but that's what I think. It's not going to affect that, so they need not be allowed. And you don't, you cannot have it an oxymoron to ask for flex the time as they go through this. That makes no sense. That, that, that's self defeating. You know? So, the law speaks about, in fact, the ILO speaks about family time. The ILO doesn't speak about worship. You know. The ILO speaks about personal and fam family time, speaks about health and safety issues, speaks about the need to look at the interest of the company as well as the interest of the community. Mm -hmm. It doesn't speak about corporate because it is in your personal time that you do what it is that you want to do. And my personal time. 